So that's Austin Olson. <laughs> you were born. I was. I was. And it was. I remember it very clearly. Did you? It was dark, and, and then it was light. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened? <laughs> oh, gee. Well, okay. I, mean, I was born in, in London, England, right? And my father was from Nashville, Tennessee, and he joined the Canadian Army in the late 30s when there was a war coming. You know, there was a few Americans mm -hmm. actually noticed that there was a, a war coming before 1944. And he moved up to Canada and a whole bunch of them joined the Army. And they were in a, in a uh, unit, what the hell was it called, something Scottish. Whatever, but they were all Americans, mm -hmm. you know, the whole bunch of them, right? Even though they were called Scottish something? Yeah, yeah, they were all Americans. In, in 1940, in this, right? This would be about 1936. 1936. About 1936, yeah. And then, you know, when the sort of war came, they, you know, they were all shipped overseas, you know. I mean, what I suspect is that they probably came out to Canada to go fishing and get drunk and they got arrested and, uh, <laughs> and we're told you join the army or we put you in jail. I mean that, that's that's my uh, sort of imagining uh, as of it but you know probably not that that wasn't the way it was. Anyway the, all these guys all joined up and they end up being shipped over to Europe and uh, that's about all I know about my father. Mm -hmm. um, you know he was kind of he never talked about anything. He met your mother in yeah, yeah, and got married. We moved to Africa in 1940, 49, mm -hmm. and then and they shipped me back to, you know, we had a farm and all that kind of stuff out there. We did all, whatever we did. I was just a kid growing up, right? And then uh, they shipped me back to England just before my 12th birthday because uh, it was half price on the plane. And then when I was 12, <laughs> it, was, it was full price, okay? So they shipped me off, you know, and I lived my, with my grandmother back in the house that I was born. Wow. And I actually went back to the same school, which was um, Oakfield School in West Dulwich, that I was at when I was a kid, huh. when I was a little kid, right, and... Did you go back and forth between Africa and... No, I never no. went back again. Oh, no, that was did. it. We stayed that. My, my, my mother and the rest of my brothers showed up a year later, and then my father showed up a year after that, you know, to England. Because okay. I noticed a lot of your work is... is remembrances of that time in Africa. Well, it, all that stuff is in your head, isn't it? Mm. I mean, and it, it's not necessarily in your head the way it happened, mm -hmm. or even the way it looked, or even the way it was. You know, it's just in your head the way you imagine it, or remember it, or think you remember it. Mm. You know, which is, um, you know, pretty interesting. I mean, uh, probably a lot of, of my sort of uh, images of Africa and everything else probably comes from <laughs> reading magazines and watching TV as a kid like everybody else, mm -hmm. <coughs> right? And the, <coughs> the stuff that I remember as being, you know, so really great, you know, well, it's, you know maybe it was, I, I don't know. Um, obviously at the time they were, they were, we were there, it wasn't really great for any black people, you know, they weren't having a really great time, I mean, they were getting paid nothing and, uh, you know, it was like slave labour, but, you know, as a kid, you know, you don't know any of that shit, you know, mm -hmm. it's just... It's just where you live, yeah, yeah. the way it, it is. But where, what part of Africa was it? Well, it's, it's what's called Zimbabwe now, it's called Ro uh, Southern Rhodesia mm -hmm. at the time. Yes. And so, um, you went to art school quite young. Yeah, I was 15. 15. Yeah, uh, when I got back, well, it was interesting, at Oakfield School, you know, the, the, the one kid that I had a lot of trouble with there, and, uh, you know, was kind of a bully, and not because not he was any bigger than me, but because he had a huge, a big friend, was a was a kid that was who was appearing, uh, was working with uh, Benjamin Britten, the the, uh, the uh, uh, composer, on a thing called Let's Make an Opera. Well, his 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 name at the time was was um, Michael Ingram, mm. right? And then after I left school and it was sort of gone years later, he shows up on television. His name's now Michael Crawford. You know, mm. he did very well with all those damn Andrew Lloyd Webber things and uh, everything else. You know, I think he lives in New Zealand now because he's retired, but, you know, it was kind of weird to go, that's that little bastard that used to bully me. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I mean, I was, I was just pretty young, and so who the hell knows, uh, you know, bullying may not have been that bad. It's just the, the way one views it, you know. Well, anyway. How, how you know, did you decide to go to art school? Is it something that... Well, I didn't. I mean, I, <clears throat> I ended up, I always like, you know, I was always drawing and stuff like that, and I went to... Uh, 
to a grammar school and uh, I didn't like it one bit. You know, I, uh, it was just, you know, I was bored and I, you know, it was just a huge, huge drag start to finish, right? And I just drawing and I got, I got, I was really interested in, in the art lessons, right? You know, we, 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 after I'd been there about a year, you know, I'd be about uh, 11, you know, mm -hmm. 12, about 12. And we had to choose as to whether we was going to go into woodwork or whether we was going, going to go into art, right? Mm -hmm. And basically I'd made this really lousy um, dovetail joint, didn't fit at all, so <laughs> I was, it was like, Olsen, art, <laughs> right? So in you go, you know. But as I say, I'd always drawn and doodle and stuff like that, so that was fine. I mean, the ironic thing is, of course, is years and years later, you know, I spend uh, you know, 10 years you know, uh, building houses and being a carpenter in Canada. <laughs> the guy that couldn't make the, the dovetail joint. <laughs> Challenging yourself to. Uh, yeah. But yeah, okay, so what happened then was that uh, when I was about 15 years old, um, it was like, you know, I had to get out of that school, you know, and we'd taken the. the, the pre-required exams and shit like that and, and in England you know you can you can go on to you know you can stay at school longer and that, or that you can go into uni to a specific university or whatever it is you want to do and uh, none of that stuff really interested me very much and um, but the only other alternative of course is uh, you get a job mm -hmm. and it was like oh man this is panic time you know, I mean, I'm 15, you know, I've, I've got, to, got to get a job or I've got to go to one of these other things mm -hmm. and study stuff that I'm not, at that, at that time, wasn't interested mm -hmm. in, right? So the art teacher says to me, of course, Olsen, you're going to art school. And his light bulb went, boom, I went, art school? They have schools for this stuff. <laughs> it was like, wow, that's great. So they fixed up an appointment for me at... Uh, at Camberwell Art School, which at the time was one of the, the three um, best art schools in London, you know, was that Camberwell and the Slade were connected together for painting, and then and, uh, the Royal College um, was it became a lot of a lot of film and stuff like that, but also did a lot of uh, graphics and stuff like that. Anyway, so I ended up in uh, in Camberwell. I went there with I took my I took my one big painting and a couple of scrunchy little drawings for my interview, and went in and put them out, and then they. You know, they gave me a position right there, right mm. there and then, you know. And, well, so here I'm at 15. Well, what do you do at 15? Well, oh, man. Well, I see girls. I see a <laughs> pub down there, right? And I don't have to go to school. <laughs> yeah, and I get a grant. This is, you know, couldn't, couldn't even, it couldn't be better, you know. Anyway, so, you know, I, I fooled around there like everybody else at that, at that age. And, and, you know, a couple, the second year that I was there, um, there was one girl who was younger than me. She was 14, I remember. She had this red, red hair, right? And she, um... Yeah, I remember her pretty clearly. But, yeah, she was the youngest one there. But what was was interesting is after that first year, of course, we were waiting for the first year class to come so that we could, like, you know, look down on them because now we'd been there a year. Well, so they all show up, and guess what? The rules had all changed, and everybody that came in that year had come out of the military or whatever, or were that age. They were all, like, 18 to 20, right? So here I'm, now I'm 16, still <laughs> four years younger than the new kids, right? Anyway, so, you know, uh, I was there for uh, quite some time, and I, you know... Uh, when I was younger, I fooled around a lot, as I say, with, with, you know, we just messed around because we were just stupid kids, right? But uh, there was so many interesting uh, uh, artists working there and teaching there, right? Well, and then I got really sort of invo involved more and more with it, you know, and then finally I ended up getting a, a scholarship at the end of it, and so they kept me there for another two years. So I, I spent sort of six years there instead of instead of uh, four, which mm -hmm. was, was great, you know. Who, who, who was but who was teaching there was, was Frank Auerbach was teaching painting and R.B. Kittai. He wasn't there all the time that I was there, but you know, he'd, he'd come out of, I think he came out of the, uh, I don't know, I don't know whether he was at the Slade, he may have been, you know, he was there with, with, with David Hockney, they were both, a, Hockney was a little younger than Kittai. Mm -hmm. and, and both these people were also, also teaching at um, the Slade. Mm -hmm. Right, and there was a, a guy called Robert Medley, just beautiful work. Um, who else? Oh, Henry Inlander, Ewan Uglow, who's now dead, taught me drawing. Man, his drawings were fantastic. 
and I see they, they just had a show actually of, um, of you and you guys, a big show in, in the UK in combination with, with David Hockney and the, and the comment was, you know, how incredible you guy was and how completely shallow and lacking in anything interesting Hockney was, you know. Mm. I just didn't say anything about that. I don't make past those kind of comments, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I know who I like, I know who I don't care for and just leave it at that, you know. Mm -hmm. Unless they annoy me, I just don't give many picture frames. <laughs> <laughs> But, what was um, the name of your school? It was called. It was Camberwell School of Art. Camberwell. Yeah, it's still there, mm -hmm. uh, but it 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 really got shitty in about the nineties. I've heard from you know other people in this because it lost its sort of fine arts thing. It became this whole universe of the arts. They put all the schools together, crammed them all in, and then said, "Okay, well, this one's going to teach whatever it is, and you know, illustration or you know, mm -hmm. whatever." But it lost its. Um, you know, none of those people. Uh, they all, of course, uh, moved on, and I mean, almost all of them died except uh, Albuck still alive, mm -hmm. of course. Although he's pretty, pretty ancient now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I was just, you know, so entranced by all this stuff. It was, it was, it was incredible. You know, I just, you know, it was just, it was just there. That's what we did. That's what we. That's what we were. You know, we were sort of stuck in this whole thing, and and. Um, that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was great. So you six years is a, a extended period of time to be. Yeah, it's usually four year course. You know, you can go from there. You can go to, to the, you know, apply to go to the slate or something like that. But I mean, I had enough by then. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, okay, why would I apply to go to the slate so I can get another diploma working with the same people that I've been working with here? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it would have been nice. But I at that point had had it with art school. You know. You know, it's it time to go off and spend 12 months becoming world famous, of course. Yeah. <laughs> still, still working on the... I've got to those 12 months yet. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it wasn't those 12 months. It's another tw different 12 months. So what you know? did you do? Hmm? What did you do after art school? Oh, Jesus. Um, well, I, I could just continue working on my own, of course, all the time and drawing and that. But I, uh, I taught in a couple of schools for... Uh, about a year and a half and I absolutely detested it okay so I got out of that and then I taught lithography for a while at a, at a night institute in, in um, Abbey Wood yeah Abbey Wood which, which was near a school that I used mm -hmm. to teach at there and, and that was kind of that was good you know because I, I you know lithography was one of the things I really liked mm -hmm. you know I haven't done it since then of course because so uh, well, when I left uh, England in 1968, I thought, well, there's no point in sending any of these heavy presses over there. I mean, they're about to have lithograph presses in Canada. <laughs> well, <laughs> really, <laughs> not any that one that one could use. And so mm -hmm. that was kind of the end of, the, of doing that. And that was the last time I, I ever did lithography, in 1967. Mm -hmm. you know. So how did you decide yeah. to come to Canada? Or is there something in between? <sighs> well... Um, well, I met I met uh, my wife, you know, in 1967, you and I, I yeah, and I'd already planned. I mean, we'd gone through a lot of things. I was working with yeah. a, me and a bunch of friends were going to open this you know club in Ibiza. It was, uh, was going to be a discotheque, and we'd even got this airline companies and everything else um, to agree to sort of fund the whole thing. And we went, we found the property, and it was it was in Tangle San Antonio Abad. Okay, and this was in 1960. Um, when we doing this? 65 would be that we wanted to do this. We found the property, we found it, and then we, got, we had, uh, you know, sort of funding in place and all this kind of thing, and it was, oh man, this is going to be great, man. Booze, women, rock and roll, I mean, what else could a <laughs> guy in 19 want, for Christ's sake, right? So anyway, so we did this whole presentation, right, and I spent hours, we put it all together, right, and then one of the guys had his car stolen, and the whole presentation was not in the car when the car came back, and oh. so it was like, Fuck it, I'm not doing that again. You know, it's done. So that was the end of that one right there, you know. You know, so, you know, we missed around. I travelled around with a with a, um, with a a uh, band, you know, a sort of road manager fooling around with them. And in fact, the guy who was um, the singer in that band, I just actually spoke to him today, um, is a fellow called Lyle Watson. And, yeah, I've known him for years and years and years. And we just got back in contact after about... 40 years, right? Yeah. And so I went and looked to see what he'd been doing. Well, he, he had, I remember he went off to the Central School of Speech and Drama, and uh, and this was after I'd actually left art school, and then when I was coming here. 
and you know to zip right through that story, he ended up as the the vice principal of the uh, Rada Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, mm -hmm. right? And then he got tired of that, so he spent ten years teaching himself how to do screenwriting. So now he's you know I mean the last four films that he's produced in England, they're up for you know they're winning all kinds of awards. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like. Okay, and I went to Canada. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and that was so we, we, you know, we did that. We traveled around American bases and stuff like that. And it was kind of fun. Again, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's just, you know, just young guys, 20 years old, you know, drinking, you know, doing stupid things. And anyway, I was going to, you know, I'd come to New, gone to New York a couple of times, right, and met quite a few people there. And, uh, got introduced to some real interesting places and things like that and I was actually offered a job teaching at the Pratt Graphic Institute okay. you know and I thought oh well that's kind of good and then I went went back there in, in, in the winter and went oh shit I mean it's like freezing cold here and then it's like <laughs> baking hot when, when's it good right yeah. like, no I can't stay here you know was there anything like people wise that influenced you when you went to New York or well, it's, I mean, it's lots of things I, that I liked, things mm -hmm. I don't do. I mean, I, I loved uh, John Chamberlain's uh, work. I loved, um, um, you know, because I worked for a while as a, uh, for a couple, about three weeks as a, for a, as a busboy in a place called Max's Kansas City. And, uh, and they had, you know, aside from the, the piranhas that they had in the tank that they would feed the goldfish to, yeah. you know, they had all this, the, the, this art in there, you know, and it was, uh, you know, Chamberlain and Dan Flavin had stuff in there. It's just there was just all kinds of really interesting things, you know, and you know, and I was I, I knew about Jasper Johns. I, I really liked his work, you know, and I liked um, Ellsworth Kelly. I, you know, I liked a lot of those guys. Um, at that time, of course, we all loved Francis Bacon, you know, because he was like our guy, mm -hmm. you know, and when we all thought, wow, you know, you just you just got to pick the pick the paint up off of it and you just kind of smash <laughs> on it and look at that, right? Well, of course, it, <laughs> you do that, you go. Jesus, um, it doesn't seem to work for me, you know, and I mean, there are people to this day still doing that, it's, it's still not working, even if people are buying it, it's not, for same reason, it's not working for them, but, you know, so he was kind of a, a big influence, um, you know, because we initially saw it as, you know, wow, we can do that, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's one of the things about, um, you know, when you see work that is really great, you can, oh, you look and you go, well, well I could do that, mm -hmm. well, Maybe you could now, after you've you know, seen, mm -hmm. but you know, the idea that these things are, they, they look as though you could actually do them, you know, so you go, oh, you know, but then when you go, you go, okay, well, um, I actually can't do that, you know. There's this kind of marvelous thing, it's, it's almost the same thing as when I watch, uh, you know, uh, Marlon Brando in early movies, you know, you look and you go, Jesus Christ, you know, you see no technique. It's go you go, holy shit, I mean how does he do that? I mean it's just like it's like real. It's like, you know, it's like that's the way he is. Well, I mean he wasn't like that at all. I mm -hmm. mean it just it was just amazing that he, he, he made it look like he was wandering through these movies. Uh, but in fact he wasn't. So the idea that well, you know, I mean if I kind of looked like him, I mean I could have done that. Well, you could have looked like him but you still wouldn't have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. you know? So that that kind of making it look as though it just is just a natural thing that anybody could actually do if they put in a little bit of effort. And, and in fact it's it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. You know, like those great you know, you know Ellsworth Kelly drawings of the the um plants and the leaf stuff like that and you go, man, you know, just takes that piece of paper and it's just in the right place and it's he stops mm -hmm. at the right moment you know that, that's not easy shit to do you know mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to you know to use uh, you know 72 you know colors and <laughs> keep putting them on until it kind of looks like you've really worked out mm -hmm. you know go well look at that must be good it's got 72 colors on it right <laughs> but you know it's so it's uh, like it always fascinated me and I got really also I've always been fascinated again with with Asian work uh, with Japanese painting and stuff like that and the difficult th thing about that for me is that I I, I wanted to, to work like that with the you know with, with, with a, you know just a brush and make those wonderful marks but I didn't want them to look like I was some kind of uh, you know imitation mm -hmm. Japanese artist you know no, no cultural appropriation no yeah. no you know and so that again becomes a, 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 a sort of challenge you know uh, as to how how do I do that, you know, and I mean you do it by you know, just working year after year after year, and either it starts to come or it doesn't, you know. I mean mm -hmm. you can't you can't make these things happen. So when would you, you know? say that 
how Asian inspiration became a thought in your mind. At what point? Well, I wrote. You know, I got my uh, my um, degree in art history, and the the, the um, thesis I wrote was on the the manga. So we know that manga isn't a new invention of Hokusai. Mm -hmm. You know, and basically what I did was was a was a was a was a, was a huge critique of the writings of James Michener, who I thought did an appalling job of writing about the, <laughs> the manga of Hokusai, but I did like mm -hmm. all the pictures in there, <laughs> you know, and so that, that really sort of fascinated me, you know, was doing that, you know, because I, I really had to look at these things, because we had to, you know, do drawings and present them, yeah, you, you know, I mean, I guess you could trace them, but they're all so small, and they, somebody would have figured it out, mm -hmm. you know, so we had to make, you know, drawings as well as, uh, you know, uh, write the thesis, and, uh, so it, it kind of embedded itself in me, yeah. But I always, I always loved those, um, you know, people who seem to be able to just, you know, draw this wonderful line, you know, like those poor clay lines, you know, just this way, that way, this way, you know. It's, you know, we're not trying to, you know, make a, a pencil mark look like a uh, look like a tree, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we're not trying to, you know. To, you know, it's just it's just a drawing. I mean, it's it's what it is. You know, you got a pencil and it does this. You take it around and it does this and it does that. You know, and you have maybe this amount of space. You know, and, and how do you? I mean, how do you divide it down in, in an interesting way? You know, now I mean, I don't sit there thinking about well, how can I divide this down in an interesting way? But when you look at it, you know, it's you know if things work. I mean, somehow the you know, this shape up here and this shape down here and they're, and this shape over here and they're only divided by this this one line mm -hmm. you know become quite fascinating you go well wow you know that's that's really interesting how did how did that happen you know and I think one one can you know write all kinds of you know sort of bullshit theories about it afterwards but the fact of the matter is you know, for me that when a painting or a drawing works for me is when I'm not trying to be an art director in it, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, I, I get work, I'm, I'm sort of in the zone, and I just work on it, okay, that one's done, move it over, work on this one, you know, maybe I look over there, and then, and then it's done, mm -hmm. okay, now if I start, <laughs> uh, okay, here we go, you know, the art director, let's put one mark over here and see if it balances, well, this <laughs> is all nonsense, of course, you know, it, 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 to me, it, it, it has to be a, um, well, it, it, it comes out of the whole, you know, universe, the whole thing. It comes out of there and it goes through your head and down your arm and out the brush or pencil and onto the paper without you thinking about how you can do this or how you can do it. It just suddenly, it comes and it's there and, you, and, you, and it flows like walking. Mm -hmm. You don't think about this foot. That foot. Yeah. How do I look? How am I walking? Well, except when you were younger and you're all dressed up and trying to attract somebody, then you go, oh, "How am I looking? How am I doing? Yeah, do the hair." But no, I mean, you walk. You just walk, and and that's how you walk. And you don't walk like any anybody else. Mm -hmm. But everybody walks the same, but they all work walk differently. Mm -hmm. So the same thing for me with this is is that, you know how do you you know get your sort of mind you know calmed down and you know to to just you know just allow the work to sort of flow out, you know. Was this something that you realized and were able to do before coming to Van uh, Victoria? No, 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 no. This is, I mean, you know, it's taken me years to, to think like this. I mean, I was thought, you know, thought like all my other artist friends, well, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you can do a bunch of shit that looks like, like, you know, contemporary art or looks like the stuff you see in art in America, sort of, but not quite, you know, the, the, and you know everybody's trying to do their, uh, you know, uh, you get the same thing in music. I mean, everybody's saying, oh, 12 bars." Do, do, do. No, 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 it's not twelve bars. Well, really? How come you're playing a guitar and it's twelve bars? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and so everybody's trying to do something different, doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And to a degree, that's kind of interesting because if you can do something different, doing the same thing, this this is really quite magical. You know, that's when you see like some beautiful Haida carving that stands out from all the others, and yet mm -hmm. it's the same thing, same same colours, same this, same that, but it's different. You go, well, gee, well, why is that different? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the mystery, isn't it? You know, why is it different? So, I have no idea. <laughs> it comes from <laughs> wherever it comes from, where, wherever we came from, wherever we're going, you know, whatever we're doing. You know. well, because what you just 
spoke about being the unique walker or the unique drawer or painter has to do with how you um, allow yourself to emit what's inside you. Well, you have. To, it's. I think it's like it's like everything else. I mean, you. I, I, I guess some people learn it very young, but it took me a long time. You know, to to um, you know, you just have to be. You have to open up to things. Mm -hmm. You, know, you can't close anything down. You know, I mean, we all, in a sort of small way, say, "Oh, I don't like that shit." Oh, I don't like that shit. But that—that's just kind of small stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you you sort of open up and, and and allow things to come in, and also allow them, you know, to come out, or you know. Well, you're the vehicle. You become the yeah. vehicle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know why I do this. I mean, as I say, I mean, it was like you know, awesome art. You can't, you're not making any of those drawers, you're not using our tools, art, right? You can break the pencils. You know, and it's, it's like, you know, so, I mean, I, I guess it sort of chose me. I mean, it was like, mm -hmm. okay, you're over here, get started. So, did Victoria and, choose you too? Well, that's a whole different story, you know. I mean, I've always had different uh, ways of making a living, okay, because, I mean, I knew as when I was a art school you can't make any money doing this stuff mm -hmm. you know I mean it's it's all luck and where you are or whatever I mean there's it's I mean you can plan I mean there's an awful lot of planning for the for the art careers now you know and I mean that's that's a lot of effort involved in all that shit you know and and it's okay for some people who want to do that I, I mean I, I couldn't be bothered to do that stuff you know I just I just wanted to do the work mm -hmm. you know this is my way of you know of, of, of creating something you know this is red splodge green black you know, it's just this splodge and you sort of take it and you go, you know, and then if you're lucky, suddenly it has, it has some life and you go, ooh, you know, mm -hmm. this, this stuff has suddenly got some life and it's your little bit of sort of magical creation, you know, that you've managed to imbue some form of, 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 of life or something to these, you know, splodges of stuff, you know. I think it's, it's, it's really very, very interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, starting to ramble, so I'm no. I'm just losing, asking. Losing I track of where I, I am. I try to to bridge from yeah, your 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 beginnings in England and coming here. You said there was a lot going on. In yeah. Well, I came. I mean, I came here. I mean, you know, I met uh, I met Robin in England in 1967. She was from California, and it was like. You know, she, Pretty nice looking woman and for some reason she liked me. I mean I didn't look too bad in those days, you know, I just looked like every every other old fart, but you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> but um I was gonna go to New York, right? But when I met her we decided I had some friends who were in, in, in Canada and in Vancouver and I said, Oh well we'll go to Vancouver. Because at that time it seemed to both of us that it was as far away as we could get from from her family in California and mm -hmm. my family in England because you know, getting married is difficult enough, you know, if you've got a whole bunch of family interference and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. You know, um, so that seemed like a good idea and it, it, it didn't seem like it was the North Pole. Mm -hmm. You know, and we'd seen these ads in the, the underground stations and the tube stations in London and it's got, come to Vancouver, and there's these beautiful posters, <laughs> right? And there's these wood, cedar wood homes hanging over the cliff and there's the oceans. And we're like, holy shit. That's what we want, right? Yeah. So we get here, what do we find? Well, that's like a place called the British Properties, where the rich people <laughs> live. And where we live is the same old slum that we could have stayed at <laughs> back in England, you know. But you, you get sort of fooled into yeah. these things. So, you know, we stayed here and, and uh, you know, Robin was pregnant. We had a, had a kid a couple of months after we got here. And then I had to get a, had a job. And, you know, so you, you know, I ended up getting a job selling cigarettes. And, you know, and the reason for that was because you know, which I won't even go into that, but a very close friend of mine was the chairman of the Philip Morris Corporation in New York, who was the largest cigarette company on the planet. And the people in Vancouver were told to give me a car, $400 a month, and to leave me alone. Well. Wow. Right, so I did that for six weeks because mm -hmm. I couldn't stand it, because I didn't smoke. And I ended up smoking most of the stuff after that. I smoked like <laughs> I should The finish was terrible. Because I'd given up smoking. I did smoke as a kid, because yeah. again, we had if you zip back to Africa, we had a tobacco farm and I started smoking by rolling tobacco up with my brother in a newspaper. We crushed it up, you know, after it was dried with smoke, that's so where we started smoking. But I'd given up and then I ended up getting a job selling cigarettes, one of nightmare. You know, and it was during, the, um, just at the end of, tail end of the Vietnam War, and most of the 
corner stores were owned by like Chinese people or whatever and god I'd get in there and you know, start talking to one and then all of a sudden I'd, I'd be getting this whole story about their family being killed in Vietnam and this side and, we, and I'd be going oh my god you know I mean I can't do this I can't go into 25 stores a day and listen to these terrible stories mm -hmm. I mean they're all terrible stories but I mean I, I can't I can't do this anyway six weeks you know and then we were down to about 70 bucks so I said okay well let's get in the car we'll go visit your folks down in California so so we like, <laughs> So every time we were down to the last amount of money that, mm -hmm. that we could put gas in our TR2, and at that, that time Motel 6 was six bucks. Mm -hmm. right? That's why it was called Motel 6. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so as soon as we were down to about I think, 70 or 80 dollars, which was enough for the motels and the food, and you know, we'd zip down there, you know, and uh, until we could sort of, you know, get sorted out again. Anyway, so, you know, and then I came back here, I did, uh, worked on. Uh, construction and uh, you still in Vancouver there. at this point or are you in yeah Victoria? yeah and then I, I got a job I worked for uh, Jim Patterson selling billboards for uh, almost two years mm. and then I had enough of that it almost seems like a bad dream all that stuff now you know and then we we had a house in in White Rock and we sold the house you know and because houses were fairly cheap at that time although it seemed like sixteen thousand dollars seemed like a an awful lot of money for a, an acre of ground and a house, you know, just outside White Rock at that time. <laughs> you think about it, well, I, I guess it is when you don't have any money. Mm -hmm. But I managed to sort of, you know, bullshit the loans. And when we sold that, we, we went, we made a little, and I went, we went and bought um, 12 acres on Bowen Island, right? So we moved over there, started building a big house over there, right? Okay, so that was the next mistake, was we bought that with another family. Okay, huge mistake, huge mistake. Doesn't matter how big it is, you can't get away from them, right? Mm -hmm. And so we ended up, finally, we just turned around and we just gave them the whole place. We just loaded our kids in the truck and we left. Mm. And we towed our trailer onto a farm in, in uh, Fort Langley. Years later, it turned out, of course, that one of the partners who owned that piece of property that we were parked on was Joe Kyle. But I didn't know that at the time. Anyway, so then from there, Robin went had to go back to work. She was an uh, occupational therapist. So she had mm -hmm. to go and do some retraining because she'd been out for a while. And then when we were looking for jobs, the those jobs were in Victoria, and we'd never been over here, and in Nanaimo. So we came over, stayed with Walter Dexter, from a chosen, because I'd known him for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And we drove, we, we came here, and we interviewed for the job here, then we went up to Nanaimo, and, I'm, and she's having an interview around again. Holy shit, why would anybody come here after the place we were just at? <laughs> you know, and I said, well, uh, I guess we're going to take the job in Victoria. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> Are you? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, and so she went and worked for 10 years and I basically uh, walked around with the kids, you know, teaching the kids, you know, uh, walked around. We, we used to walk all around Victoria, all over the place all day, mm -hmm. you know, just me and a couple of kids. It was, it was good, you know. And... Uh, what happened after that? Oh yeah. Well, you had the uh, the bed and breakfast. Yeah. Well. Then I got I got into that into the hotel business. That was another thing. Cause I was working on um, construction again at the time. You know, back mm -hmm. on construction because the kids were we got them into a school that we we quite liked. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, <clears throat> so I was building houses. You know, with a, with a, with um, a bunch of people, and then including a you know guy I became very friendly with. You may notice Rand, Randall Racinos. You know, as a Guatemalan architect, you know, mm -hmm. I've known him for years too, and we, we did a lot of houses together, right? And one of the things we were working on was this, uh, the Beaconsfield Inn. And I said, what, what's it? And I looked, and I looked at their brochure, and I said, mm, and I said, counting up the numbers, you know, I went, holy shit, we need one of these. <laughs> <laughs> no money. Yeah. No, no. Anyway, so I just, you know, continued working, I just kept looking for property, looking for property, you know. And at one point, um, one of the properties down here that used to have, um, well, the one that used to have the the um, the old custom house where they, where they kept all the Chinese, mm -hmm. for Christ's sake, just down here that was owned by a guy called Harold Husband, who's long gone. And right next to it was where the propane place was. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just down on Dallas Road there, right? And I remember offering uh, 1.2 million to them for the, the, the propane place. Well, I, mean, I didn't have any money. <laughs> but I did have credit cards. And I did a lot of balls. It was like, mm -hmm. well, you know. Anyway, so eventually we've, um, we found um, a, a place up on Michigan Street and it was um, just the right 
right size, you know, it was on the corner of Michigan and Government. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was four apartments and it was really clean, right? And I found out that those four, the, the four apartments that had been rented out by this lady, Miss Holland, and uh, she'd had it for, for years and, and she'd never raised the rent and, it was, and, and the people were all, worked for the government and they were all making pretty decent mm -hmm. salaries and they were paying like $110 a month for their mm -hmm. rent when everybody else on the planet was paying $600 mm -hmm. at that time. Right, so if you've got a commercial property, I mean, what, what it's worth is basically how much rent it's bringing in, mm -hmm. plus a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So she went and got the place appraised, and they appraised it, I think, at, uh, at $110,000. So I said, well, fuck, I'll give you 160000 She went, really? I said, yeah, 160000 right? So that's what I did. Got the, uh, you know, credit cards, put some money in one bank, yeah, went to the credit union and said, well, I've got, you know, $10,000 in the bank, mm -hmm. ready? You know, ready to go with this, I got some more money down in California, it was like bullshit, mm -hmm. right, and so they said, well, you, okay, they liked the idea, and they, so they gave me the the, the um, mortgage, and they said, but they said, you know, you're not to have it, any other mortgages, right, well, of course, I already had other mortgages, but mm -hmm. they hadn't shown up yet, because I'd had them done as as loans to somebody else, that, so that when, once I got that, I signed all the mortgage, this other mortgage showed up, and the credit union was really pissed off, but there was really nothing they could do because I already had it and I already had their money. And so, what was really funny, because they, they give you these um, um, construction grants, and, and it, you, get, you know, they give it to you a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, when everyone's coming after you with baseball bats because they built it and you haven't paid them yet, then the credit union will give you, or the bank will give you that much to pay them off, right? So basically, they called me in after t 10 weeks and two days because they hadn't heard from me. Yeah, and they were re like really angry. And But I walked in there with the final appraisal, okay, and a completely built hotel that was fully booked for the whole summer. And they just mm -hmm. sat there open mouth. They said, but you didn't start building until 10 weeks and two days ago. I said, well, yeah, how long does it take to build, you know, 10 rooms, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and a, a lounge and, and a full kitchen and all the gardens. And they just was open mouth. They never seen anything like it. I guess but they hadn't been used to. People well, that's how long it took us. Yeah. You know, that's why when you know I had, you know, the back part of this built a long time ago, and it took the guy a year to build something that was like two stories, and and you know, and I'd built a you know a, a basically six thousand square foot inn in ten weeks. I mean, I I just didn't understand it at all. You know? hmm. I'm not sure that it can be done now, but. So do, how did all of this? Life happened to uh, affect what you were doing in your practice. Well, everything you do is is who you are, isn't it? You know, it all affects you. I mean, I don't know specifically, but I mean, no matter what I was doing, I was always drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would have shows, have a show here, show there. You know, then when I got the hotel, it was really interesting because I didn't need any galleries at all, and you know, I I found that you know that I would sell. You know, I mean, I sold a. a, a an eight panel drawing out of there for 10,000 bucks. You know, I sold uh, like, uh, you know, painting, different paintings and th stuff like that. And I sold art from, for other people out mm -hmm. of there. And, you know, so I saw really no, no, no future in uh, dealing with a gallery. And I realized that it was, instead of trying to, you know, take an empty room and, you know, and, and, and sell paintings out of it, you know, you, you take a room, you put the paintings in, then you put beds in the room and you rent the beds. <laughs> you know, I mean, it made much more sense to me. You know, they yeah. can look at the paintings for free as long as they pay for the beds. Yeah, okay. You know, that made a lot more sense, you know, and at that time. I did that for 10 years, and then it was, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, was, we were up at 4 o'clock in the morning, every every morning, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and going until probably yeah, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but then we were also on call all night. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this went on. Uh, and, we wouldn't get any days off. I mean, yeah, days off. And I, got, yeah, we got tired mm -hmm. and had enough of it. You know, we got into a big sort of legal battle that just became very weird and I'm ready to get into it. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out of there, you know, I ended up working up at the Art Gallery of Victoria. You know, and it was it was unbelievable because I always remember. When I got there, and I remember saying to there was a friend of mine who was a who was a um, hotel guy, right? He'd been out of work for a long time, and while I while I while I had my place, he said to me, he said, "Why? Well, I just got this job." He said, "Finally got a job." I said, "Well, how much do they pay?" And he said, "Well, twenty five thousand a year." And you know what I said? I said, "Well, fuck! I wouldn't get out of bed for twenty five thousand a year." Okay, so I end up in, 
the Victoria Hut Gallery working <laughs> for, for 14,000. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first year that I was there, I was still spending, you know, close to $7,000 a month because mm -hmm. I'm still living, I'm still driving a goddamn Jag and going to see these bends, we got all this bloody shit and I'm mm -hmm. in millions of dollars worth of life insurance and it was like, okay, you know, the money that I did have now was almost gone. I said, okay, I've got to stop doing this. This is foolish, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, I, I kind of liked doing that at the gallery. I mean, I thought it was... Well, people... I, I, thought, it, I thought it was important to, you know, I, I mean, I didn't care how, you know, how crappy I thought an artist was. The fact that they were making an effort and doing something, I thought, well, you know, hell, if I can, if I can you know, help them get that sold, then I thought that was actually doing something worthwhile. Well, people, so, you know. people comment on, on how how your input and your, your delivery of their work to the public was, and still is, considered really important. Well, I did, I did pretty well. I mean, I, I mean, I sold a hell of a lot of stuff. And uh, I remember when, when Pierre Arpin came and took over and we, we sat down and that was when, you know, I said to him, I said, I said you've got to get all these people off my back. I said, the problem here is, it says, you know, I said, you, you can't be paying people nothing and expect them to, <clears throat> to go out and do stuff for you. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I agree with that. And he said, well, can you, and he said, what, how do you, what do you want to do? I said, well, I think you should be paying like percentages based on, you know, say, you know, you, you have a, a basic salary and if you sell this much, then you get, you get some of it. You know, mm -hmm. I said, that's, that's the way to do it. That, you know, and then you give incentives, you know, and he said, fine. And he, and he worked out a really, it was, it was, it was very good. I mean, I wasn't making you know, the kind of dough I was making uh, at the hotel, but by that time I'd, I'd, I'd figured out that if I didn't spend anything, I didn't actually need anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I, I, you know, we all sat down when he was there, and they, they always do this, they always, they always make a five-year plan, and which, which is great, except if they leave after a year, the next person comes in, and then they make another five-year mm -hmm. plan, and, and then another, and so you never get anything done. But he was actually there long enough, or almost long enough, because I remember sending him an email um, after I left there, I said, hey, Pierre, guess what? I said, the amount of money that we had put down for art rental that I was to bring in on the fifth year of the five-year plan, so, yeah, I said, we're right on. Brought it in, went up exactly as we said, you know. Hmm. It was kind of, it was, it was kind of fun, you know. I got, uh, you know, 11 years. I mean, I'd never actually had a job before, mm -hmm. you know, that, that I'd sort of stayed with. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was all right. I, I enjoyed it. And, um... Do you think your work changed because you worked in that environment? No. 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 There was absolutely nothing in, in there at all that influenced me. You know, um, things that came through there that I, I liked. I liked a lot of the Asian collection. Um, I liked. Uh, it was, you know, some of the contemporary shows that came through. I mean, I like all kinds of things. I mean, that doesn't mean you know just because I, uh, you know, I didn't sort of go in that direction. I mean, probably the the, the most interesting thing that happened to me going to that art gallery. Okay, and if I hadn't, if I'd hung on with the hotel and not gone there, it never would have happened. And that was when I got there and I met um, Jamie Druin, who was mm -hmm. just a very young guy working there, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, well, I said, what do you do? You know, I mean, I said, you, I said, you drive in a car and you work, you know, Thursday night and Saturday night, what are you, some kind of, you know, multi-million mm -hmm. or something? <laughs> anyway, I said, well, what do you, so I do photographs. I said, oh, Oh, really? You know, well, can I go and see something? So he brings it full photo in one, one day and I went, holy shit, I'm looking at these incredible photographs. Mm -hmm. And I phoned up Martin Bachelor and I said, uh, hey, I said, you got to see this, you got to give this guy a shot, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what he did, right? And then I was able, because of, you know, people I knew working to, to point Jamie into a, into a job. Mm -hmm. That he wanted to do, and then from that he took off. He just, he just exploded out. It was mm -hmm. great. And so, a few years, a couple of years after that, you know, he said he came up to me. He said, you know, he said, um, I think we should do, uh, you know, he said we can do, we can do like uh, you know audio performances and that. I went, oh man, what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, I mean, I said, I, I realize I told you that I can do anything if you give me enough time, <laughs> but you know, it's a bit sudden. But anyway, so we, we started to to mess around with this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, as well as continue with painting and stuff like that. Because when I had the hotel, I uh, just skip right back to that in 1991. I had a, I had a big show at Open Space. You know, mm -hmm. it was like it was great, fantastic reviews. Must have been about 600 people there. I've never seen that many people mm -hmm. there since. 
you know, and uh, it was it was great, and it was because I I pulled my I I'd gone completely out of the whole art scene because the whole thing had pissed me off. You know, and certain things had happened in town, and it really pissed me off with mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of the artists in town and have anything to do with them ever again, and. Um, When this show came up, you know, I mean, I put, I put, um, I put, put some, put, you know, put some stuff in to have a look. Funnily enough, it was, it was a, a video that Augustine had made of my stuff, mm -hmm. you know, a long time ago, because I've known him a long time, you know, and I shoved it through. He said, well, yeah, yeah, I think you should apply for a show. He said, oh, well, no, another show, Jesus Christ, you know. So I stuffed it all in there. So what happens is, you know, I end up getting called by Sue Donaldson said the way they wanted to do a show for me, and I said, "Oh, okay. <laughs> Gee, that sounds good." Well, you know, all of that stuff was kind of irrelevant. I mean, I did the work; the show was great. What was really relevant to me at that point is that, that all of those people—they were so nice to me. Mm. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was so nice to me, and I went, "Hey, maybe everyone in the art scene isn't a complete prick," you know, because suddenly, instead of being angry. With people, were, these people were so nice to me, mm -hmm. and I thought, this is great, you know. And you know, and I met. I mean, I knew at the time. I mean, I had certain people I I, I knew sort of who were sort of friends of mine. I mean, I knew Jim Gordon. Yeah, I mean, I knew, I knew <coughs> Jack Wise. I knew Jack Kidder. I knew um, uh, Siebner and all those guys. You know, and I got along with all of them very well. You know, <coughs> but I mean, we weren't friends. You know, because we were, we were in different different ages and different mm -hmm. doing different things, but. Yeah, we were sort of acquaintances that liked each other, sort of liked each other's work, or and even if we were not influenced by any uh, any of it, we admired the fact that they were producing, mm -hmm. you know, work, They're actually doing it. Because I mean, I think the most important thing with anything in your life is showing up. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to show up. If you don't show up, you know, whether it's showing up for your job or whether it's showing up to put some stuff on piece of paper or you know make some noises with a guitar or whatever you know you have to show up and you show up and you show up and you show up mm -hmm. and if you do that things begin to move along mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just sit there and go well I'm gonna sit here and when I get this really great idea I'm gonna run outside where I've got this really tidy studio with all the brushes lined up waiting for me mm -hmm. and the papers all waiting there mm -hmm. but as soon as I get the idea I'll go out there and I'll, I'll do it well you know, then it'll still be there in a hundred years you know you're not going to do anything you know you, 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 you go out there even when you've got a hangover or whatever you go oh shit and then you pick up something you go <laughs> <laughs> you know and either you say oh and then you leave or, or it sort of goes oh oh you, you sort of get up and you say, <laughs> you know, and it, it, you get dragged into it, you know, because that's, that's what you do. And, and this is the whole thing about about sort of opening, you know, just being open to things. Because, you know, things things happen if you show up and you, you do the job. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, most of the time it's going to be no good. But, you know, one of the reasons I was always so strong on teaching people how to draw, and the reason I've always been, you know, so strong on people learning how to draw, you know, if you want to be, you know, a, a, a painter or a, a, any kind of artist really that involves sort of visual art. Um, and I, I guess this came from, you know, my time at um, Campbell Art School when, you know, when these guys, and they were all working artists, like when you and Yugla would sit us down there and he'd have his goddamn ruler up here and his measurements here and his this and this and this and he'd working on this stuff like, you know, and you'd, you'd look at it and you go, man, it's like, map you know but at the at the end of it you know what what he had here was was pretty much what was over there I mean he didn't look l like them like an illustration of them mm -hmm. but it, it was position right everything was everything was right okay so this kind of interested me you know and what it what I what I realized was that it was the actual looking and the struggle and looking was all going in your head like this, like this, and and, and at the end of the day, it didn't matter what the hell mess was here, mm -hmm. you know, because you'd spent like eight hours just really trying to figure this out, and it all oh, it's all in your head, it's all moving around in there year after year, all this looking you've done, so you, you know, suddenly you, you realize that you know how many steps there are up to your front door, because you looked at them, you've been <laughs> walking at them for years, you had no idea, they were just steps, who mm -hmm. gives a shit, right, now suddenly there's all oh, these 14 steps, 
<laughs> that and this one's, you know. So you st you begin to to notice things, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, to me, the, the drawing thing is like it's like teaching somebody how to fish, okay? You can stand out there with a pole all day; you're not going to catch anything, okay? So you teach somebody how to do it. They can go out there. They go fishing. <laughs> For me, again, the drawing was the same thing. You know, you, you suddenly have this ability with your hand and your eye mm -hmm. to catch these ideas that go through. Because we all have ideas. How, do you, how are you going to catch them? Mm -hmm. How do you catch them? What is your method for catching them? That, to me, was my method. You know, because I'm, I I'm drawing, suddenly something goes through my head. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have no idea, oh, I've got this idea. Quick, let's go outside where I've got all the brushes lined up. Okay, uh, now what was that idea? Oh, no. <laughs> gone. It's gone. It's yeah. gone. Like, you know, and so... You know, and this is just just my view. This doesn't necessarily make it so. I mean, this is this is what it's what's worked process. for me. Yeah. So the work that you did in '91 for Open Space <clears throat> was that involving drawing too? Is that something unique, special, or what happened? Well, there was one uh, at Open Space. There was one. It was called uh, Butcher's Apron, Butcher's Hook. I actually have a catalogue. Have you ever seen the catalogue? No. Phyllis Sirota was on the board. Yeah, at, the, yeah. at that time at Open Space, yeah. you know, so she knew who I was, and she mm -hmm. she, she, she liked my work, you know, mm -hmm. and so and she wondered what the hell I'd been doing because I'd sort of disappeared, you know. Anyway, so they did me this thing. The only drawing that was in the drawing was, was ten foot by five foot. The drawing, and these are actually these things, okay? okay. So there were charcoal drawings, you know, and they're all figure drawings, all you know. And I those ones right on top there. Well, they're from they're from later, a little oh, bit later, later but okay. but not long. Because I haven't I haven't done work like this for years, yeah. You well, know, not since ninety one actually in ninety two. I mean, I stopped. I, you know, I, when I looked at this show and w walked in there, I looked at it, you know, and it was I got great great write ups for it and everything else. Mm -hmm. Frank Norris said did did a wonderful um, uh, review and everything of of the whole show, mm -hmm. right? And I stood in there and I looked around and I went, okay, so you said everything that you have to say about any of this shit. I mean, there's nothing else to say. You can go out and paint more of these, mm -hmm. but why? You're so, talking about you <coughs> as your, your, yourself. Looking at myself, yeah. yeah. I thought the show was good, but there was, what the hell are you going to do now? You know, I mean, everything you've got to say about this whole being pissed off with everything that's going on everywhere, it's all up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go on forever, you're dragging it out, but, but why? What's the point? Where is it going to go now? So mm -hmm. that's when that's that's when the you know the difficulty arises with with things. You know, is that when you begin to notice, <clears throat> and again, this is just this for me. I had no idea how anybody else thinks. I mean, I had no idea at all. But for me, I begin to notice. Okay, so you seem to be sort of polishing up your logo. You know, I mean, this stuff looks like things you were doing five years ago only it's like way slicker it's all polished up you're getting way better at it you mm -hmm. know but it's the same thing mm -hmm. you know it's just like you know now you could do it with four strokes instead of ten little struggle strokes mm -hmm. but it's the same thing it's polished up so you know, for me that becomes a problem it's a turning point where what do i do now you know what what am i thinking what do i what do i have to say am i finished you know so you're, you're talking about what people call now branding Oh, that's all shit that is. That's for cornflakes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who cares about that? <clears throat> yeah, so these were all, it was a black and white, but these were all, these were all oil paintings, okay? Mm -hmm. And these are things that I have them all sitting in there and I have no photographs of them. And they're all, they're all um, 10 foot by 5 foot, okay? Mm -hmm. Those are pretty big. And yeah, it was, it was, the, sh the show was, it was, I thought the show was, pr was pretty strong, you know, and I got, you know, I was really happy with, with, with the way, it was painted in the way your way the way I was handling the paint, you know, and uh, but you, you know you can see that these are like 1990, 19, you know, nineteen eighty nine. Why I just really don't have any interest in in, in uh, um, you know smudgy old figure paintings anymore mm. that people do. I mean, I'm just not interested in them, you know. And I had panels of these hanging in my hotel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I would just hang up the panels. Because the other thing that, that has always, always interested me, and it still does now with, with work, and that's not to sort of get involved in, in designing it, but, but working it so that, that any fragment of the painting is the whole painting. Mm -hmm. And I think this came from you know, my, you know, one of the... the the people I admire, have admired the most and, and still do is, is, is um, Giacometti. Okay. Okay, now what I loved <coughs> about his paintings, you know, was the fact that he just, you know, he just kept 
working at him and he just stared at these people and they stared back at him, right? Yeah. And I mean, even when he was doing the plant, it stared at him and he stared back at him, right? And, and, and it got muddy and muddy and he scraped it off and put it back and moved it around and you end up with this, these things, and the same thing with the sculptures. I mean, he just worked and worked and worked mm -hmm. and worked and, and these incredible things. Well, you know? Diego used to have to take it away from him. Well, what was, what he said, you know, which really influenced me forever, you know, he said, Somebody said to him, well, why do you work all that stuff like that? Every little piece is there, you know, like this, 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 this. Keep changing, moving. He said, well, he said, if everything that I've ever done gets smashed up and the only thing anybody finds is a piece of one of my sculptures about this big, all the information of everything I've ever done is in that piece. I and, I, that. and I went, that is right. That's what, I like that. Yeah. And I went, wow. You know, so it's, it's like... Everything has to work, even if it's, you know, whatever it is. If you just take one piece and show it, it doesn't matter if all the rest is there. Mm -hmm. the, you know, people say, wow, it's, you know, nice painting or whatever, you know, but not, oh, is that, is that a piece of a painting with nine pieces missing? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, so that, that whole thing about everything being, you know, in, right in here, it's like if all you've got is that, yeah. then that's, that's it, that's the painting, you know. So when I paint over things, which I do, quite often it's because I look at it and go okay <clears throat> I can fiddle fuck around with this and try and make it work and maybe I can at some point but you know the best thing for this is just to get rid of it and start again or just paint over it I often I'd love to sometimes you know if the things are really not working just you just you know just grab a whole bunch of whatever's down here and just sort of scrape it over or, and then just let it dry and then you look at it and all of a sudden you've got something coming through, the bits you missed and mm -hmm. things, and it just suddenly goes, wow, there. And there it is. Mm -hmm. you, suddenly it's it's another thing entirely that's come from what was there before. Mm -hmm. But all the information from what you did before is behind it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all in there. You know, these oil paintings I've got left sitting in here, the, these, some of these big ones back here. I mean, I stopped doing those because I got, you know, I got nowhere else to put them and I didn't want any fumes in here. So I got onto acrylics, which had improved mm -hmm. since the 60s. And I, I quite like them, you know, particularly working on paper with them. Mm -hmm. But what I used to do, because I showed a lot with uh, Deborah DeBoer when she first started with, with Rogue, the Rogue Gallery, and I was always, again, working in, you know, three panels. They were always triptychs. Mm -hmm. And they were always 10 feet, and that's because the wall that I had when I had the studio over here, I could fit three panels of 10 feet on it. <clears throat> that was it. <coughs> so there was no putting anything else on them. I mean, it's the reason I work on three here. That, that doesn't mean that they they all go together. Mm -hmm. But it's just like I can put, put three pieces of paper up here, okay? And you know, if that one, if I don't like what's happened there, I just move over here. And if I don't like that, I move over here, and then I move back there. Okay, so it just it just gives me three things I'm working on. But I would take the paintings down from the show, and I would have a show maybe in two years, and and the show I had would be all done on top of the paintings that was in the show that was in her gallery <laughs> two years earlier. So now some of these paintings are like this thick, you know, and they're like <laughs> heavy, heavy, heavy. And they finally, after all those years and, and reworking and moving and working, coming back to them, suddenly those things are really, really fine paintings. I'm, that's why I still have them. The rest mm -hmm. of it, anything I didn't like, I got rid of years ago. Mm -hmm. But suddenly it does. They, I take one of those pounds and it looks like I picked up everything that I had and I just threw it and it all landed in the right place. <laughs> I just went, that's how he does it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Didn't take two minutes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> one of them may have, yeah. but all the rest didn't take two minutes, you know? Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, yeah, that's... Okay, well, um, you know, to sort of zip right into the, you know, the, the whole meditation thing. I mean, I've been meditating on and off for uh, 40 years. I'd stop, I'd start, stop, start, stop, stop. My wife's been at it for 50 years on and off. <coughs> we didn't have any groups or anything. I mean, we've been in some groups for a while, and then you go, oh, you know, and you move on and whatever, you know. Anyway, we finally sort of, you know, came right back to sort of Soto Zen, which is how we sort of started out, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what we do. I mean, we, you know, we sit usually, you know, 25 to 40 minutes in the morning, staring at the wall, <laughs> you know, that's what you do. But, you know, you just try and... And over the years it does what it does, you know. Um, I mean, I'm a lot, I'm, I'm a lot more 
patient. I mean, I used to have a terrible temper. I mean, I probably could now if I got worked up, but now I've got so old and feeble, if I, if I punched anybody, I'd break my wrist. So I, I, just, I don't do that anymore, you know. I used to like fighting, now, not anymore. <coughs> but the whole, um, the whole sort of, I know that, I guess it ties into, you know, to, to my sort of love of, you know, the, the sort of, you know, Japanese line, the way that the brush moves, you know. And not, I mean, I'm using Japanese as a metaphor, I mean, the Chinese are the same, and, you know, and then you, you have a look at some, you know, calligraphy from, from uh, yeah, old sort of Persian calligraphy, which is completely different again. All these, these kind of wonderful things, but, but the, I love the way that, you, again, you, you, know, you, you take that big brush, you know, and I use just grubby old dirty brushes, you know, broken down, or I go down to the, to the store and I find, I say, what is that? Four bucks. Oh, it's this for putting on stain. Oh, really? <laughs> I'll take two of those, please. Yeah. You know, and using that, almost like a. It's almost like a. a, a I, I hate to compare it with meditation. I mean, meditation is something different. Well, what's to that? What, what I'm doing here. I mean, it's. I guess trying to clear your mind and quiet your mind down works in a, in a similar way to trying to take up. You know, say you know clean white sheet of paper and just put you know, one or two marks on it and, and have it finished yeah. you know it's not it's not easy to do no but when it happens it's like well Jesus you wonder why you've got all that shit on all those other things you know well that thing that you're making for the for the your public what's it called oh what I'm doing now oh it's, it's you know well it's it's a, it's a Buddhist thing it's called uh, Rakasu Rakasu you wear it it's basically it's um, you know when you're in a meditation it's for um, it's supposed to be a fragment of uh, a Buddha's robe and it's it's designed as, 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 as hundreds of little pieces that you hand so you know I'm still working on the damn thing you know and it's like little rice fields the way the stitches go and you you take that when you take what they call it, jukai which is a ceremony you take <coughs> when you sort of agree to accept certain precepts. Well, you know, these are not difficult things to accept. I mean, things like, you know, don't kill people, you know. Yeah, don't be, five of them, right? Don't be, don't be you know, banging other people's, you know, girlfriends and wives or whatever. You know, don't, you know, don't be stealing, you know. I mean, basically, uh, basically, uh, you know, basic sort of morality. That, I mean, the stuff that, that I do anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. So the idea of sort of encompassing it within what I do anyway, I thought, well, shit, I mean, uh, why wouldn't I do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I... I really like the people that I've met, the group that we sit with, you know, and all just like you know, serious, serious in what they're doing. I mean, they're humorous people, not, not just, not, not, not dreary. I mean, I mean, they're, they're serious in what they're doing and, you know, and it's, you know, we're all in sort of different sort of stages. And I, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's kept me, you know, I'm not in jail, I'm not dead, you know. And a lot of my friends are in jail, a lot of them are dead. You know, and if I'd stayed in England, I may have been one of those. You know, who knows? It reminds me of the way you described your drawing teacher doing the microscopic measuring and calculation. It was it was, it was incredible, and, yeah. And 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 the process involved in creating this garment, this Buddhist. It's it's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it really is, and you know, the, it, there's a specific way that this has to be done, and uh, <clears throat> because it's sort of tradition, you know, but each one is different because we all do things differently. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. But you know, it's I mean paint you know painting and, and drawing and, and that that's uh, it's really been you know, my life. That's what I that's what I do. You know? Well if, and, going back to the dovetailing and maybe to close, it's if you think about the dovetail, how everything intersects, but the, they're 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 diagonal. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the shape of, of the way that the joints come together. It, diagonal is a real um, transept. It, it carries you, it, it holds you tighter. And it's almost like you already knew how to do that. That's why they didn't send you to the wood class. Well, I actually do know how to make dovetail joints now. <laughs> 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 no, but I mean the whole spiritual um, simplicity of, of that whole process yeah. is something that you intuitively had that you could bring to what your work is doing well yeah, probably you know we're we're you know we you know we we as i said to so many people you know i mean we come in we fuck around we go out you know <laughs> that's that's it 
So, you know, there's no other thing happening. There's no, as far as I mean, there's nobody watching down to see if you've been a good fellow and you know, so we can put you on this crowd with this half and set on this part of shit over here. You know, it's like, that's all, I think that's all just like, to me, it's just juvenile stuff, you know. Mm. I mean, yes, we are all part of one thing, you know. And I think that's what's important. You know, it's, it's all, we're all part of the same thing. You know, try not to hurt anybody, try and help people. And if you could help, I mean, you need to help, you know, your own family or one person, because if you try and help everybody, you, you don't help anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you can only do, you, you do what you can do. I mean, if mm -hmm. you sit there trying to do everything, then you might as well forget it, because you're not going to get anything done, you know. So, you, you know, you just concentrate in your, your little piece of the universe, a little piece of the world, and you do that. I mean, you talked about, you know, what I wanted to be remembered as. I don't want to be remembered at all, you know. I mean, it's, you know, my, my family will remember me until until they're all dead. And then that, as we as somebody once said, we all die twice. The time we die and then the time that the, the last person that ever remembered us died, we die again. So, you know, but that's okay. You know, it's like, I'm just glad to have been here. You know, it's like, it's a great trip. You know, I mean, it's like winning the lottery twice. First of all, you're born. That's amazing, given you know <laughs> where, where all those things disappear to that, that, that could have not made you, mm -hmm. and uh, and the fact that we were born in, in you know in a place where we're not you know in, in India breaking up ships by hand in 120 degree temperature, mm -hmm. you know. So I mean that's kind of like winning the lottery twice, mm -hmm. you know. I mean so it's so I don't buy lottery tickets because I figured I already won twice. So what mm -hmm. the hell am I gonna Waste my time trying to win a third time, it's foolish. You know. So, there you go. So, I, I explain nothing about how or why I do any of this. I just do it because I do it. Mm -hmm. you know, and what it means, what does anything mean? You know, it's just as important to me, and it's important that I try and, you know, not keep turning out the same thing endlessly, mm -hmm. you know, because I would get bored, you know. And if it changes direction, I, that's kind of good. It means I'm still thinking about things and not thinking about the same thing all the mm -hmm. time. You know?